Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're connecting from today. Um, and welcome to ICFA's annual conference, Protecting Principled Humanitarian Action and Honest Conversation on Risk. My name is Anherid Lang. I'm the executive director of PHAP, and I'll be serving as co-facilitator throughout the day today. I'm delighted that PHAP has this opportunity to collaborate with ICVA to ensure that their annual conference can go on in spite of the complicated times we're dealing with all over the world, and that we can all come together, at least virtually, uh, to continue these important discussions, this important work, in spite of, of the need to be physically apart today. Uh, I'd like to give the floor now to Ignacio Packer, Executive Director of ICVA, to open the conference. Over to you, Ignacio. Thank you very much, uh, Angarad. Yeah, today, ICVA's first ever virtual annual conference. So my welcome to, to everybody, and uh, it's really with great pleasure that I see so many names of uh, people we work with in the, in the chat. Uh, so an appreciation also for the for those who are making the effort with the time uh, the time zones. Um, the annual conference um, will host uh, inspiring discussions on the risk to principal humanitarian action, and in turn the the risks taken by many of you by NGOs to deliver effective and efficient humanitarian assistance to those most in need. Um, of our five senses, touch, taste, smell, hearing, and sight, well, hearing is the one we will be relying on most uh, today for the annual conference, but I'm sure the energy from the speakers and, and your interventions with questions will, will promise really a, a lively discussion. I spoke to, on Monday, I spoke to a journalist. Uh, he first complimented IGVA's agility to, with PHAP to shift its face-to-face uh, -face annual conference to a virtual conference. And then he indicated it's, it's his surprise that this conference had not been revisited to, to take into consideration the current disruptor we're all talking about. And well, while COVID-19 is inescapable in the discussions, but the expectations are that we will focus the discussions on the current violations of international law in plain sight and ways forward and initiatives. We will not shy away from talking about the attacks on health facilities in, in Syria, one every four days in 2019 and many other uh, uh, topics. Having said that, um, some will not be able to join because on the front line of the COVID-19 uh, response and scaling up operations and shifting to more re remote work, work. And certainly, I want to recognize all these efforts that are uh, ongoing as we run uh, this annual conference. In a collective statement, um, titled COVID-19 NGOs critical to the delivery of effective principal humanitarian assistance. This collective statement was issued yesterday by uh, IGVA and it was it's staying true to IGVA's mission and the IGVA board calls to adhere on the basic humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. So I, I really recommend this uh, reading, and perhaps it can serve you also as, a, as an advocacy uh, support. Okay, so our first 90-minute session today will set the tone and discuss the risk to a principal humanitarian action. We will then follow with uh, session two to focus on risks that NGOs are facing, due to principles being put at risk. And then the third session will build on what we would have heard to look at some of the, the ways forward and initiatives that can mobilize collaborative and collective action among NGOs, member states, donors, UN, and, and other partners, and including youth. And I'll come back to that last element, including youth, in a moment. So mobilize collaborative and collective action. And then I went on and I said, including 
youth. And yes, youth. Sarah Mardini. Sarah Mardini was to open the conference uh, with me. And Sarah, unfortunately, cannot make it with us today. I exchanged again with her last night, and she really regrets not to be able to join, and agreed I would share her story. A very compelling story, uh, uh, quite a responsibility, I find, and I just hope I give uh, justice to it. I don't like speaking on behalf of others, but here Sarah really um, asked and agreed to, to share her, her story. Um, Sarah was arrested in Greece. Uh, when uh, she was a train, she's a trained rescuer, and she she volunteered to to spot boats in uh, in distress and help save the lives of refugees. She was then incarcerated and charged for smuggling, spying, belonging to a criminal organization, and more recently they added fraud as well. She spent 107 days in prison and was released on bail in December 2018. If found guilty, she could spend the next 25 years in prison. Humans are capable of incredible compassion, but Sarah's compassion really astounds. Uh, it has pushed her to put her own life at risk for humanitarian action. And that is just a taste of what Sarah has been through. Sarah was born in Syria in 1995. In 2015, crossing from Turkey to Greece, she saved with her sister 18 refugees by swimming their waterlogged dinghy to the shores of Lesbos. To my question, Sarah, why were you arrested? I was giving water and blankets every night on the shoreline. My only answer to the accusation is that nobody puts their life in danger on a dinghy because there is somebody waiting for them to put a blanket around their shoulders. The state is saying that trying to save lives is a crime. Sarah also shared the following. The sad part is that I survived war. I survived the crossing in the water. But what is happening to me is much harder. I'm now a student in Berlin with 25 years hanging on top of my head. And Sarah continues. The state has succeeded. Now there is nobody on the shorelines of Lesbos. And in a determined way, she also shared with me, I am going to be proven innocent and I will go back to the shoreline. She also said, you might be next. So you must speak up against the criminalization of humanitarians and speak up for migrants. Even if not physically or virtually present, Really, thank you, Sarah, for bringing to the discussion the story of your life, your energy, and your call to speak up. So, we will now turn to our panelists of session one. And for this session, focusing on the changing environment humanitarian actors are working in, we have four speakers to set the stage on the importance of protecting and promoting principled humanitarian action. We have, calling from Juba, Mrs. Gloria Modong Morris. Welcome, Gloria. Gloria is Executive Director of Titi Foundation and Deputy Chair of the NGO Forum South Sudan. We also have uh, uh, Mrs. Inger Ashing. CEO of Save the Children International, welcome Inger. We have uh, Philippe Besson, welcome Philippe, Head of Multilateral Division of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs, SDC, Swiss Humanitarian Aid. 
really a great pleasure to have you all with us, and thank you for your flexibility. Aha. Did I forget somebody? <laughs> Our privilege also to have with us Yves Dacor, Director General of the International Committee of the Red Cross and the Red Crescent. Well, Yves, you have almost handed over to Robert Mardini as upcoming Director of the ICRC. And it's a great pleasure uh, to have you with us today. Probably one of your last public uh, speaking in your current function. And, uh, well, I guess you're not likely to put your tongue in your pocket. Uh, and I'm sure you would offer us some of your provocative thoughts. Uh, your tongue in your pocket. Is that, is, that's a rather nice French, French idiom. <laughs> but it, it means keeping discreet about something. No. <laughs> okay. So I will turn over to uh, to Eve to to start with the with the panel, if that's uh, that's okay with the the panelists. And Eve, we would like to hear from you because, as I mean, there are more and more. We see the humanitarian principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence being put at risk. I mentioned earlier the, the, the hospitals, but also staff um, being targeted in conflicts. The RCRC movement alone, I believe you've, you've seen over 90 volunteers killed on duty in the past four years. So my question to you to, to start the panel, what is the price we all pay when the principles are at risk? Thank you, Ignacio, and, and, and good morning, good afternoon, and maybe good evening to uh, to all of you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be with you. Uh, and can I just commend also uh, Ikva and and uh, and all the colleagues? I'm very happy that we are moving to um, even if I hope it won't it won't be like that for the coming months. But I'm very happy that we are able to have that conference despite of the situation. Um, you know, I was listening very carefully, Ignacio, when you were talking on behalf of Sarah, Sarah Mardini. And I think we need to recognize first that we are living in a time where um, the way us and the collective is defined is shifting. And I'm amazed to see how much politicians, governments, uh, but also uh, opinion leaders have a tendency to define us more and more as a very close, you know, excluding people. You know, us without the migrants, us without the women, us without this religion or there. And I think this is something that we are facing more and more as an organization and all of us, right, in this conference. So I think more than ever, I really believe that uh, principle will remain and are, will be at the core and will possibly be the things which distinguish us from all the rest of people. I think we are in a time where, for example, impartiality, uh, you know, making sure that uh, aid uh, uh, goes to the most vulnerable and not only to my community or to my people uh, will be absolutely central. So, yes, I think we are. My concern is the first people who are paying the price are the people affected themselves. I feel that if I look at my own organization, we are able to not access the people that we would like to access as always. Uh, I feel also that we're living in a time where government and non-state armed group are on purpose putting pressure uh, on population very clearly. And we're living in a time where there is no consensus between states, including on basic humanitarian principle. Um, so I think the price to pay is an enormous price. It's a price for the people affected by war first, by then the people trying to flee the war or flee crisis, the migrants. Uh, the price to pay is also for our collective, for our society. If we are not in a position to accept that what counts are the most vulnerable uh, and we are a, an agreement somewhat or let states to criminalize humanitarian actions, uh, we're living in a time where our common grammar, and I really always look at principle as a common grammars, are at risk. And this is maybe the most difficult. And we have, as humanitarian, have a role to play not just uh, to operate uh, and to really focus more radically than ever on principle, but also to reflect about how could we bring that in our society and create maybe new taboo uh, about principle. Thank you, Eve. I think I think this is great to 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 start the conversation. Um, 
I, I will be coming to, to Gloria in, in a moment also to, to talk a bit more around the risks to, uh, uh, to communities. Uh, but, but before, before Eve, can you, can you, uh, tell us a little bit more also, um, as we follow up on the criminalization of uh, of uh, Sarah Mardini's uh, uh, and and many other uh, humanitarian workers and and touch a little bit on the safety and security of frontline humanitarian workers uh, how how can we in, ensure this 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 these elements of the the uh, the operational the reflections the new taboos or other are there other things, and and I know we've had a number of conversations, and and I I, I really um, remember when uh, when I was with with you, and uh, and uh, one of your ICRC staff uh, was uh, was murdered in uh, in uh, in uh, in Nigeria. That was in October 2018. How can we how can we better other elements of how we can better ensure security of frontline humanitarian workers? Eve, a few words on that. Uh, I think that we would have to start with us, I think, recognizing that we're living in a very complex environment, but not just to complain and and criticize other. Uh, I will come back afterwards, of course, there is a responsibility, of course, of states, for example, uh, or armed groups, but let's start with us. I think the first things I would say, which strikes me a lot in organization, is somewhat how much we somewhat have a tendency to transfer risk. You know, we see a lot of organizations who are transferring risk to their local partner, or we see within organization uh, the transfer of risk to local staff, right, or to locally hired staff. So I think there is a first recognition that the way sometimes we operate and the way we are putting our own people at risk need to be thought. I'm deeply convinced that you can't have part of the population takes more risk and the rest of the population, most of the time the international, are bunkerized somewhere. This is already one of the big problems we have with our own ecosystem, if I look around that, which we have, we have a discrepancy about, you know, managing risk and, and risk taking in our own ecosystem. And this is not on the table. We speak from time to time, but we don't operate and don't act. So I think if I look at my own organization, one thing we understood is you can't have people in the organization believing in the Red Cross or believing into ICRC uh, if they feel that they are more at risk than their colleagues because of a contract. That doesn't work. So I think let's start with us also to be serious about that. It also goes, point two, to a much more open and clear uh, guidance, instructions, security. Yes, it's true. Today, security management is more complex than ever. Let's make sure that security management is not centralized like the UN are doing it, for example, that it is in fact decentralized to the people directly in charge of the connections, the relationship uh, with the people affected, but also to the response. I think this is a central piece. So how do we think security management? This is central. I'm deeply convinced that the people who are managing the operation or managing the relationship with people needs also to be in charge of security. And then the headquarter can help, could maybe support, but should not centralize security. And this is also not on the table. That needs to be on the table. The third one is, I think we should ask ourselves collectively, and this is where the principles are so important, if we want to maintain a minimum of security, uh, we need to be able to agree that our vulnerability is our strengths. We can't just be protected by armed guns. We know how limited it is, how difficult it is. We, know, we need to be able to talk to everybody involved in a conflict or in a situation. And to do that, you need to really be able to establish relationship over time which means you can't just jump in in a context and then try to understand. So it means also investing in time, energy, long-term relationship management, really. And it means also talking to all actors, even if it's very painful, even if some of the actors, armed, armed groups, for example, are not reachable for a moment. Uh, but we need to maintain these ambitions to be able to, in fact, engage and connect with everybody and not being, I would say, informed by the way states sometimes or non-state armed groups will label the other. This one are the terrorists, this one are the bad. You can't, you can't talk about it. And that's why principles are so important because if people perceive us over time, and I really insist over time, as predictable humanitarian actors with a very clear modus operandi, it will increase a little bit at least the tolerance that we get from actors. But here the point is really investing, 
taking the time. If I reflect, you talk about Nigeria, for example, it took us all years to just get tolerated by the armed groups, by Boko Haram in that case, and some of the splitter groups, but also by the Nigerian army, just to be tolerated. It doesn't prevent you. You can still have incident, and we have terrible incident, but at least this is the minimum in which we need to operate. So I would really recommend us to be able to first look at us and put things on the table a little bit more openly about transfer of risk. What are we talking about? How do we train our people? How do we invest in time and energy in order to be able to do that? And then, of course, there is a second cluster, which is much more about how are we, um, you know, how do we bring accountability back on the table? You know, when it comes to state, non-state armed groups, how are we doing that in a time where, in fact, nobody's interested about that? If I look at Syria as a good example, but we can talk about Ukraine, we can talk about Somalia, we can talk about Afghanistan or Myanmar, where we, you don't have right now a level of accountability which allows us to really engage with state when it comes to principle, right? And respecting also humanitarian actions. So I think it's a very, thin land, uh, uh, lane to, uh, uh, to, uh, to navigate. My last point is we need also to accept, and I think it was interesting again to go back to what Sarah was saying, we need also to accept that sometimes the community themselves are in better positions than us to respond. And maybe that's also a discussion. How are we have a dis what type of discussion do we have with the communities when it comes to humanitarian aid? And here it's not just about do you have aid or not, but what type of aid are you doing? And I think here again, having principal discussions with communities is very interesting. And again, I want to insist on the impartiality. You know, communities sometimes, for good reason, are reaching out to the diaspora, to the people to get aid and to get uh, help themselves. And for good reason, what happens? How does that work? How does that work to the other community maybe who have no help? So I think there is also something that we need to learn is how do we engage with community in most difficult situations where themselves maybe are in a situation to provide aid to themselves. How do, do we discuss also sometimes hard facts, hard, hard issues around impartiality? Thank you very much, uh, Eve. There's a lot there, and I also see a number of questions that are coming coming up. So many other topics that you've uh, uh, touched on, uh, and of course, including the transfer risk to, to local partners, is coming up in the in the different in the different questions. So most likely, we'll be coming back uh, on this. But I would like to turn then to to Gloria um, to to come to go to go a bit further on on the question of the the risk. Uh, to communities and and uh, Gloria is a, an activist in uh, in South uh, Sudan. Eh? I think Gloria it's mainly for women and children, and you've you've given a, a, a lot of your professional life on uh, on that uh, on that focus. Um, what risks do communities and uh, of, perhaps you would want to uh, focus on women? What, what risks uh, were, do, do these groups face when humanitarian pr principles are are put at risk in, in your country or in other countries? Gloria, I, I hope the connection is uh, is good with you. Over to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, one, when the principles are put to risk, what happens to communities, mainly in the case of South Sudan where we are operating, is one, the physical safety risks and sexual violence to women and girls in these populations that we serve. And a clear indication is in 2018, where in one of the locations where we are operating in Bentu, which is in the northern part of the country, we had around 125 women and young girls raped by armed groups. And this was all, you know, um, as a result of access denial to humanitarian workers to be able to assess those locations. And as we talk, much as, you know, we've been on the follow-up of this, at the forefront of this, um, there have been no much really conclusive um, justice that has been brought to the victims affected. But then we are also seeing increased humanitarian restrictions in terms of movement to deliver aid to the different vulnerable communities within the country. And as a result of that, basically for us as advocates, we do, we have decided to, you know, engage in long-term relationships with the communities and also the groups. In areas where we operate, we've mainly seen that we operate in locations whereby one side is 
controlled by armed, armed men in government, and the other side is controlled by armed men in opposition, and then there are also those other warring parties within the same locations. So ours has been a lot of advocacy engagements with this. Let's We're able to also people and why you know we need to deliver the aid to the vulnerable populations without restrictions. So we currently sit on what we call the local access units in the different locations we're operating in, and we've been able to negotiate, especially things around access to humanitarian organizations within these locations of operations. An example is the Ye River locations, where they've been having different kind of armed groups, government opposition, and other political um, parties were that are that are in those two locations. But also, um, we've also actively been engaged as part of the steering committee of the NGO forum to also negotiate access to you know the wider communities of the NGO fraternity within the country. Thank you, um, Gloria, and, and I, I think it's really good you, you've taken some really concrete examples also of of those elements of um, of negotiation of the also at times managing the expectations uh, with beneficiaries. Um, you you head a national organisation. Um, you you are uh, in a uh, you are uh, the deputy chair of uh, the NGO Fora in um, uh, Forum in South Sudan. So I think it, if you could cover a little bit uh, a, a specific focus on national and local organizations, what are the, the specific risks? Eve touched on, on some of the elements, but it would be good to hear from you as well. What are the specific risks that... Uh, national and local organizations are facing when when you're exposed to to threats uh, when humanitarian principles are put at risk gloria well um one of the risks that the national NGOs have been going through has been one on the issue of security and safety whereby we've witnessed in in the past couple of years national NGOs have been killed along the line of duty. And one of the main attributes is one, the political situation in the country, but also the fact that, you know, when we are undertaking operations to deliver the most needed um, services to the community, that we as local partners or local NGOs do not, are not catered for in terms of, you know, security um, measures. The partners or the donors that we work with do not provide, um, I'll call it the some level of insurance to the to the staff that we have, you know. So basically, you just go in and serve the populations, and if anything happens in the line of duty, that is it. But then, as a member of the steering committee of the National NGO Forum, we have gone ahead and been, been in position to to plead with some of the donors to the forum and have some level of contingency fund in case national NGOs are caught in the line of duty and unexpected events happen, let's say um, unexpected events such as evacuations to the local staff of the local NGOs, or there's a problem with death and some certain arrangements have to be done or compensation has to be done to the affected families, then the NGO forum has a very small or limited budget that sometimes we pick to support that. But then it has been an advocacy point also as part of the advisory board member to the South Sudan Humanitarian Fund that have been pushing that, you know, national NGOs be considered for some level of security funding so that they're able to also um, ensure their staff and they could also deliver services in a much more um, safer way compared to just, you know, the UN or the international organizations. Those kind of risks. 
Thank you very much, um, Gloria. We, we will get back to you uh, uh, with, uh, with some of the, the questions. Um, uh, for technical reasons, I'd like to uh, uh, check the, uh, the sound with, uh, with Philippe Besson. If you can just say a few words, and, and then I'm going to be turning to Inger. It's not yet, uh, yet your turn, but just to check the sound. Could you, could you speak, please, Philippe? Yes. Hi, Inacio. Yes. So uh, I think now the headset functions. Good, well, good, good. I get back to you in a moment, but for, first I'd like to turn to uh, to, to Inger. Um, it's really great that you found the time to to come on uh, um, to our virtual annual conference, Inger. Um, you took the role as uh, uh, CEO of Save the Children International while in uh, September, so you're just over the bar of 200 days, aren't you? Eh? And <laughs> a very complex function and very complex moments with blatant disregard for the principles, putting NGOs such as SAVE at risk. Uh, of course, the high volatile and political context. I'm not going to talk about Brexit, uh, populism, but the pressure on multilateralism in, in general. Yeah, and uh, sometimes I wonder how global CEOs uh, manage in such complex uh, situations. Eh? So, um, C certainly, a uh, word of appreciation um, for your type of uh, of uh, function and showing uh, lead leadership in this uh, complexity. So, Inger, would you agree with what Eve and Gloria have shared up to now? Uh, um, and what elements would you like to to build on from there? Um, on the perspective of you heading one of the largest um, INGOs, uh, what what do you see as the main risk to principal humanitarian action? Inger, it's, it's up to you now. Yeah, thank you, um, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, and, and thank you uh, uh, for, for, for holding this uh, conference, and I think it, it's great that we still have the ability to talk about these very important questions. I, I would say that I... I agree with uh, what uh, Eve and Gloria have been saying, uh, absolutely. There's a couple of things that I, I want to add. Um, and uh, when, when we talk about the main threat to principled humanitarian assistance, I, I think that uh, our ability to operate to ensure we can reach out, and in our case as an organization, it's about children and their rights. But our ability to do so is increasingly jeopardized by a couple of different things that are happening around us. And some of them have been mentioned by by Uben and Gloria already, but I think it's it's important to to reinforce uh, some of it because it's it's really uh, jeopardising our ability, all of us. Uh, and I think it's it's absolutely a lot about uh, the national laws uh, where we see increasingly challenging uh, to put independence in partially of humanitarian systems. Uh, Nigeria was mentioned; we see that as well. Uh, the other thing that was uh, I think you, yourself, Ignacio, was uh, referring to briefly in the introduction is that we see and have seen much more so uh, over the last year uh, terrorism uh, and sanctions. And that means our ability to act dedicated and. Uh, if, if this is Mark, if I could ask you to talk more directly into the mic. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Now, I was saying that the, the complex legal frameworks related to counter-terrorism measures and sanction regimes is something that we see as uh, adding a lot of complexity uh, and our ability to deliver in Syria, our humanitarian response there is, is, is an example where it's increasingly difficult for us uh, to try to uphold the principles because it's, it's constantly challenged by, by legal frameworks and national laws. Um, the politicization of, of uh, humanitarian aid and aid in, in general has been mentioned. Um, it's, it's, Yemen is one of the countries where we absolutely face, there, face that. Security for staff ha have been raised by others. Uh, and uh, we see that that insecurity and, and the risk uh, is increasing uh, tremendously. Uh, 
couple of years back that that wasn't the case for us as an organization. And we are talking quite a lot about uh, shrinking civil society space, but we see absolutely the same in the humanitarian space uh, and that that is shrinking in many of the areas where we work. And if I just uh, can add something on, on consequence for, for populations, uh, uh, being a child rights organization, we've been used to uh, a great uh, consensus around the, the need to protect children. That is something that everyone has been in agreement around. We need to protect children. Children are our children and children are innocent. But that has changed. Uh, today, uh, in many situations where we work, children are no longer treated as children. Uh, they are, are uh, deemed to be associated with groups designated as, as terrorists, as to take one example. And uh, so when we've been used to being able to access children, uh, we, in quite many situations, we, we feel and, and yeah, we cannot because uh, of security reasons or, or yeah, legislation around counter-terrorism, etc. So, so that is is absolutely a very new and changing uh, environment for for all of us. And uh, a lot of the things that I've been talking about and others is is shared by all of us. But uh, that's my my immediate response to to your question, Ignacio. And as I said, I totally agree with what Irvin and Gloria said before me. Thank you, thank you, uh, Inga. And you, you really uh, depict, uh, uh, well, very much the the talk and and no act when uh, when we consider the amount of promises that have been made to to children to to remain in the in the focus of your um, of your organisation. Um, what 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 can NGOs do better uh, to promote and uh, and and protect principal humanitarian action and 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 with that focus on on that group of children where we have the, the uh, so many promises made by uh, by states to to protect uh, children and there's talk and not enough acting what what can ngos do better i i think that's a really important question and i think that the situation where we are now, because we've been experiencing this over the last years and increasingly so, and it will probably get worse before it gets better. Uh, and we we all know that there is a lack of respect and implementation of the international legal frameworks uh, when it comes to humanitarian law in general, children's rights uh, specifically, and the protection of children in conflict. And, and what I think we as, as NGOs need to do is to work more uh, together to collectively put pressure on states and non-state armed groups uh, to better uphold international, international standards, to push the international community to hold them into account. We are trying to do our part when it comes to, to children and, and stop, stopping the war on children. But I think we as a, an INGO and NGO community need to do that much more collectively. Uh, we also um, should work uh, as a community uh, to strengthen and include safeguards uh, for principled humanitarian action in legal frameworks. Uh, and we also need to collectively build an open, safe and transparent dialogue among us uh, and with states and donors, because we will not uh, be able to continue to, to do the humanitarian work that we've been doing for, for decades uh, if, if we are not changing some of the Rules of of uh, and and some of the yeah some of, some of the regulations around us and, and we need to to make some of the donors and states aware of of what it means that when they are are uh, yeah transferring risk to to national uh, partners for example so we we have to to talk more about risk management uh, we know we need to talk about uh, how we balance legal compliance with humanitarian compliance. And I do think we as, as INGOs and NGOs have to be more propositional and uh, be more proactive and propose risk-sharing models uh, to our donors and member states. Thank you very much, Inger. And yeah, and for us to be more propositional. And, and that's where uh, we really want to lead the whole day with that third session where it is trying to get together those existing things or things that we could initiate 
around collective work, about, about being propositional, as, uh, as you have highlighted, uh, Inger. Um, I would like to turn to uh, uh, Philip. Philip is, is calling from Bern. Philip has a lot of field experience. Uh, yes, uh, Bern is the capital of Switzerland. It's neither Zurich or Geneva. It is Bern. And and Bern is not considered as a field location, is it, uh, Philippe? And I have heard you on so many occasions in meetings and public speakings, and you do not shy away from discussing difficult um, issues, and I'm sure you won't either today. Uh, you work for a government, Switzerland, that has a long-term commitment to reinforcing respect for IHL. Uh, IHL um, is negotiated, agreed by states, and yet again, as with the discussion just now with Inger, uh, not always respected by the, the states. Where is the accountability for breaches committed? And how does Switzerland uh, seek respect for IHL among the community of, uh, of states? Philippe, would you... Would you try and, uh, with the l unfortunately limited time that uh, that uh, that we are dealing with, can you try and cover some of uh, of these uh, of these points? Um, Switzerland, um, uh, a country with which the dialogue uh, is 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 really easy, and Switzerland being very supportive. Um, Philip. Yeah. Thanks very much, Ignacio. Um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give a very brief overview of, of the things we, we endeavor to do with, with others, and then I'll make four quick points uh, on the basis uh, of what we have uh, heard so far. So, um, in terms of what we have tried to do jointly, in, in particular with ICRC, with others, with, on the one hand, to, to invest into the notion of uh, actually supporting states, but also encouraging them um, at uh, respecting IHL. There, there has been quite a long process in the past years that we have concluded because we were realizing that um, there were blockages. So um, IHL, it's one thing to 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 be a party to the conventions to to have signed up to them it's another one uh, in in context to be in a situation to be perhaps um, criticized on actual implementation so obviously it's a it's a very touchy topic which we'll try now to take up from another angle which would be in inverted commas more 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 technical because there is a potential and an interest as long as we don't give any appearance of being political uh, there, there is scope for, for a dialogue. We, we also have endeavored to work within what's called the good charter and donorship. So it's about 40 plus uh, like-minded donors who adhere to 24 commitments. Basically it's a uh, about do no, no no harm and we are the co-chairs with uh, ECHO uh, have been for the past year and a half another six months um, and amongst the four priorities we have we 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 have also worked on IHL and did a bit of polling with with the people uh, colleagues in the field and that uh, leads me to to the four points I, I wanted to to make um, um, and of course, uh, I was particularly touched uh, by what Gloria said about the, the situation in South Sudan. I was in South Sudan from early 2014 to mid-2017, so I can relate to what she has said. And that leads me to, to those four points, uh, to be a bit provocative, especially towards us, humanitarian uh, agencies and, and us as governments. Um, I, I think tendency has been, especially in difficult uh, context of protracted crisis, to, to focus on delivery. We want to 
to show our authorizing environment, the government, our parliaments that yes, uh, we we deploy that things uh, the food items, non food items do reach the the people, and this means that we engage indeed into a lot of de-risking. Uh, I have experienced situations in which only uh, local national organizations would go into the field because on the UN side, UNDSS would prohibit it. And uh, of course, the, the bilaterals would, uh, would not uh, engage. And so th this notion of what's actually happening and the perverse effects of uh, just dropping it onto the, the next one, the one that's closest to the field, I think is also a challenge to, to actual um, respect of IHL principles. Uh, the, the law per se, there is also a total uh, system of impunity as we have seen in, uh, in South Sudan. And all this makes it extremely difficult to remain principal charter and uh, act uh, under the circumstances. Also, let's face it, um, all in the chain want to stay on the market. So there is this element of do I get out and then uh, the next will come in or not? And I've seen two Asian countries um, uh, automatically, when one was investing with the government in charge, nowadays the, the, the other one w would basically come in just to show that it also uh, exists. That's the first point. Secondly, uh, IHL, in terms of training, in terms of awareness of what it is about, uh, I think in most contexts people know about it. They have been trained, and ICRC and others have done a tremendous job about that. But what I've experienced in South Sudan, to stay in South Sudan, is that at points uh, you, you could say that violating IHL, like in Southern Unity in, uh, in July 2016, was part of, of the whole uh, military strategy. And it, it was really shocking to see that at the same time, because we were trying to broker a peace agreement, the diplomatic community by and large remained silent. So um, uh, in terms of enforcing, in terms of pressing the matter, it's really difficult. And it's also complex because, of course, there are moments at which we want to talk, uh, we want to think first of uh, the, the, the people the, the, whom we want to, to assist and our company, and that means some very difficult trade-offs. My third point is about the humanitarian uh, community at large, uh, and there I would say states, but also INGOs, the, the, the whole global group we, we see on almost each and every field. It, it, we agree very easily, but take issues of counterterrorism and sanctions. It's quite obvious that it's not the Chinese who call the shots. So we we have sort of a of a dichotomy, uh, uh, almost a schizophrenic stand within our government. Because on the one hand, we we want to be virtuous, we we want to be principled, and on the other hand, there, there are elements of government who really uh, are in power, and they. They call the shots. And of course, in this respect, Switzerland is in an easier position because we don't have armed troops engaged abroad. Otherwise, the equation changes uh, almost uh, totally. And that leads me to my last point. Uh, I, I, I like the, the, the points made by, in particular, Inga about um, engaging collectively uh, to be propositional. Uh, I I think one could go even beyond that. What donors are not accustomed to is that somebody says no. And for one uh, individual organization, it's very difficult. But for a coalition to say, okay, see there are limits to how we, we can engage and to what extent we, we, we are going to accept 
that we have to adapt the principles to, to a, a certain context. So I, I think um, it's very important, and that's going to be my conclusion, that the, um, the NGO community, and there I, I'm really thinking international and national local, the raises issues of both ethics and power relations in a smart way. But uh, the more you, you overcome the asymmetry in terms of uh, financial, but also political clout on, uh, on the, I'll call them the donor side, on the state side, and manage to make the point that on the long run, we have to engage in a way that's more principled because it's also, in the end, in the state's uh, own uh, interest. So show us the mirror, if, uh, if you like. Over. Thank you very much, Philippe. Very, very good four, four points. I, I would like to go back with a short question to you around collective work of donors and um, uh, transfer of risk to NGOs. You, you are co-convene of the Grand Bargain local, uh, localization uh, work stream. You also mentioned uh, Switzerland's uh, role as co-chair of the Good Humanitarian uh, Donorship. And when we talk about the collective work, and um, and we've, we've heard this question of the risk being transferred to NGOs. Now, I am going to come back for a moment to the COVID-19 and say donors, are you working collectively to take exceptional measures around the COVID-19 for quick decision making, for flexibility, and a real risk shaking, a sharing uh, attitude, exceptional measures for an exceptional moment that we have? Are donors at the moment working collectively on that, Philippe? Yeah, I think we we were caught uh, unaware originally. It took us uh, two to three weeks to, to to really start putting our act together. Yesterday, there, there was a call by uh, OCHA and WHO together, and we should see in a week's time, it's late, but it's better than nothing, the consolidated, aggregated UN appeal and that will make things uh, easier. We don't have a COVID um, call under GHD because uh, the, this is a very special situation. In a way, uh, like uh, we, the Swiss administration, are, are basically in lockdown. And so th there is uh, quite a dangerous effect, of course, in terms of... Uh, uh, humanitarian action and access, we, we are uh, preoccupied with, with ourselves and we are trying to overcome that. But this means that we, we have lost uh, some time. But I think we can look forward to, um, to really some uh, common action. I think both the, the UN system, but also the Red Cross Red Crescent movement and us, uh, I'll I call ourselves the, the like-minded donors are, are getting there. So uh, late, but uh, we are on the right path. As to the grand bargain, uh, I think we have some good news. Fundamentally, what we, uh, in terms of organization, what I have hinted at, we, we could share with the eminent person's office. And we were making the case that um, we, in a way, we have to, to uh, politicize or, or make the localization issue diplomatic, uh, at least in two terms. One, um, our governments do not separate humanitarian aid from their overall uh, interventions in terms of diplomacy, defense, and so on and so forth. So our message was, uh, if we really want to go for more local, then uh, you, the ministers, and you, Mrs. Kark, you, you have to, to talk to, to your peers. The other thing is that uh, we obviously, in pragmatic terms, we see that most donors want intermediaries. 
because uh, that reduces the fiduciary risk, and that has to do with the de-risking issue I was addressing. So the eminent person committed, and I think we will be able to get a sort of a, of a, of a coalition to enter a much more active and substantive conversation, in particular with the UN system, so that uh, typically the WHPs, the UNICEFs, uh, the, um, the, the HCRs of this world would indeed uh, integrate in their subcontracting, um, without wanting to sound too nasty, the, the elements Gloria was, was mentioning, so that we have first more security and and a natural investment in capacitation uh, through um, the, the contracting with the UN system. On the other hand, uh, and that's very good news, the Red Cross, uh, Red Crescent movement with national societies development initiatives is now really uh, gaining speed. So I think there we, we, we will see some, uh, some real progress uh, over. Thank you, thank you, Philippe. And now what do I do? Um, we have hundreds of people sending questions, and then uh, be, even before the conference, there were so many questions coming in. I find, I find it amazing, and hundreds, hundreds of people online. So here, Angarad Nishani, help, help. I'm, I'm sure you've been clustering the questions, so please, <laughs> over to you. <laughs> Yes, indeed, Ignacio. There are a lot of questions coming in uh, as we speak, which is excellent to see. Uh, we've selected four to, to start off with. We'll see how many rounds we can get through. Uh, so first of all, this is coming in from Fiona, connecting from Afghanistan today. It's a question for Eve. Fiona is wondering, is the ICRC more risk averse now than it was in previous years? What are the trends that you see within the organization when it comes to risk appetite? Then we have a question coming from Rezo in Bangladesh. This is a question for Gloria. And Rezaul is wondering, how do you find, Gloria, the role of UN agencies when it comes to facilitating the work of lo local NGOs to create a more conducive environment for principled humanitarian action? Then a question coming from Ole in Germany. This is a question to Inger and to Eve. And the question is, isn't it right uh, isn't it the right of a government to expect international organizations to respect and follow national laws? I mean, how often do we not even know about them, like national data protection regulations, etc.? Isn't that also a part of localization? And then finally, a question for Philippe. This is coming from Leah in the UK. Leah writes, the localization agenda encourages leadership of humanitarian action by local organizations. However, resources to handle associated risks are all too often not transferred to local actors in proportional ways. So how do you think donors, international NGOs, and the UN can best support the protection of local organizations and thus ensure that local or localization is done in a principled way. Back to you, Ignacio. Thank you, Angarad. And uh, perhaps, Eve, if we can start with the, with the question from uh, Fiona from uh, Akbar, Afghanistan. Is ICR more at risk? Is ICRC more risk averse? I think it's a, it's a very fair question. So I would say when it comes to Afghanistan, and then I will try to zoom out a little bit, uh, uh, Afghanistan, had, yeah, there was never a golden age where it was easy to work in Afghanistan, A, for Afghan people, for the Afghan Red Crescent, if I look, but also for the ICRC. Um, over the last years, yes, we had difficult moments, absolutely. We lost uh, one of our most tragic incidents. Uh, we, we lost uh, uh, six people who were killed on, in one incident. Then we had two other people killed. I mean, it has been very difficult years, if I just look for us and I think we also sometimes were under enormous pressure from parties uh, some of the parties not recognizing what we did and so I think yes Afghanistan is a places but no we 
have we are not more risk adverse. We have not lost our ambitions to try to carve a space for a very principled humanitarian actions. Maybe what is shifted and changing is it is more difficult. It's more complex. And especially in a country right now where we are moving to, uh, I hope, something slightly better, but we also know that the transition time between conflict and maybe something which is, I don't know how to call it, but, you know, close to something a little bit more uh, low in terms of intensity, these are moments of extreme difficulties where all the parties are playing politics. Now, if I zoom out, if I look at my own organization, uh, I've been the director general of the ICSC since now almost 10 years, and I've spent only four months without hostage. I think there is also so that questions, which if I look in terms of security, one of the biggie for me, one of the most complex issue is hostage taking and how do you deal with hostage? And this puts pressure on an organization, absolutely, on the team, on the family. Uh, and so it's not just, you know, decision being taken in Geneva or in the field. It's also the pressure that uh, security or hostage, for example, put on, 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 on an organization. Uh, and I think we have hostage still in Syria, we do have hostage in Somalia, for example, and it is very difficult for us to operate in this environment and trying to make a distinction between the crisis, uh, our own crisis, and then the humanitarian response, which, which makes it also very difficult. Last but not least, and Inge and also Philip mentioned that, and Gloria also in a way, is we also find more difficult now to engage on some of these questions with a number of actors, especially governments who are obsessed about counterterrorism. So to make a long story, no, I don't feel that we are more risk adverse, but yes, it's more complex without any doubt to be able to find and carve the space to have a principle you made in actions in Afghanistan and in other places. Thank you, Eve. Um, Gloria, would you want to take uh, Reza's uh, question from uh, from Coast in Bangladesh? Good afternoon, uh, Reza. So the, the question is, uh, how do you find the role of the UN agen agencies and are they condu how they bring the conducive environment or not? Gloria. Well, to some degree in South Sudan, Yes, because um, practically the humanitarian sector is under the leadership of the UN at the moment. Um, what I say to some extent is that mainly, you know, um, there is no much inclusion. There's some level of inclusion, yes, but it's not the way we would anticipate, whereby majority of humanitarian decisions are conducted by the UN themselves on behalf of, you know, all partners which includes also that they don't sometimes bring the local partners who are well versed with the conditions of the ground on the table. But through the NGO forum, we have been able to push for certain slots, especially in what they call the advisory board and the HCT, whereby we have some small representation of the locals to be able to also, you know, bring some thoughts to the table. So I would not say that we are fully there, but um, yes, to some degree, they are doing something, but I think there's need for more inclusion, especially of local partners on the table. Thank you, Gloria. And um, In Ingo, would you want to take uh, Oli's uh, question, Oli calling from uh, from Germany, on the on the question of how do we really take into account or not the the national laws and questioning if that's not part of localization to take to take more attention on the national laws, uh, Inge. Yeah, and, and thank you for that question. I think that's really an important one because. Uh, you say if if we talk about localization and, and since that is where we want to to head, I think it's uh, really good to to discuss what what is when we say things like uh, national laws are, are putting pressure on our ability to act uh, as humanitarians. I think it's it's very important to discuss that. I, I, so I, and I think in general, of course, we all have to to follow national laws. But but the challenge we are facing is that. Quite a lot of, of, of the laws we see are ignoring international laws, um, and I would say that uh, the Geneva Conventions are not up for negotiations. And if we have national laws in place that, that, that are not respecting the international laws, then we have a real issue and a real problem. 
uh, I think what uh, Yves was saying when he was talking about uh, the importance that we as humanitarian actors have the ability to engage and interact with, with all the humanitarian crisis, to have open and transparent dialogue when that is not possible because of national or international laws and regulation that makes it much more difficult for us to, to do to do yeah to, to fulfill that duty as, as humanitarians. Uh, so I think um, it's it's more complex and more complicated than just saying that we should listen to national law because it's their right to 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 impose the laws and decide in, in their national context. But but we have, as I said earlier, to balance uh, the humanitarian principles and and, and put that in really to, to uh, legislation and, and finding better ways of making sure that we can still uh, respond and, and do what we are here to do as organizations and and, um, and it has it has become much more work so use I would say in a way to to uh, that 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 is really challenging our ability to act uh, and, and deliver our humanitarian uh, work around the world. I don't know if you want to add it, but that is my initial response. Thank you, Inger. And I'd like to turn to you, Philippe, for uh, Lea's question around how to ensure that localization is done in a, in a principled way, localization, a, a topic that you've been working on for so long, haven't you, Philippe? Oh, yes, uh, well, of course, the, the issue of uh, resources and also sharing, including of power sharing, empowerment, genuine partnership, that's all at the core of um, of the, the, the localization agenda. Um, let me start with a bit of a paradox. And, you know, uh, I've experienced that even in South Sudan, but we have also very, we had very interesting uh, Conversations in Iraq. I, I I think local national NGOs should think much more of domestic resources mobilization, like also uh, more traditionally in a way development NGOs uh, would, uh, be because um, that provides for autonomy and freedom, and not not to accept. Just because we, we we have to go ahead, we, we we need to cover our costs. We want to engage, to to, to be exclusively in the hands tied up by uh, by the fiduciary and um, considerations, rules and regulations, as uh, set up either by by the the different uh, agencies or the the bilateral donors. Having said that. I think um, what we should head towards, and that's definitely an ambition of, uh, of the work stream, is, is that we all push in the same direction. So we, we already have sort of a set of um, advisory notes uh, about elements of capacity, uh, the, how, how to, to, to handle different uh, perspectives of, uh, of the localization uh, agenda. And so th this constitutes the gist of, uh, of the things we believe we should collectively do. The other one is a bit of a push and pull. I go back to the notion of uh, collective action or agency. I think uh, on the donor side, there's uh, an increasing realization and admission that uh, on, in the long run, if we don't want to come ever and ever and ever again uh, and try and fix crisis, we have to invest into institutional uh, development and organization development that will lead to, to better and more peaceful conflict transformation, uh, better preparation in, in case uh, of um, natural disasters, and and so on and so forth. On uh, on the the civil society NGO side, I think it's very important that collectively you you tell us. Uh, if you want us to, to do and give our best, 
then we need conditions. And then, of course, more concretely, um, let's take, for instance, the country-based pool funds. There's really an option, and I've seen this uh, also in South Sudan and in Iraq and in other places. You, you can use this platform to ensure that it's not just about delivery, but that um, organizations that uh, are supported through the, the pool funds that they get a chance uh, to to stabilize, to develop their capacities, and to 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 take a conducive role once, hopefully, the the crisis um, is uh, is over. But I think talking of leadership, uh, leadership is something you you need to 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 demonstrate. It, it takes. Uh, a bargaining capacity, it takes also a capacity, if not to say no, but to, to question, to, to challenge the, the other. Uh, um, we, the Swiss, are relatively privileged because, for instance, we don't have uh, standard templates for uh, a proposal. But how many times were, was I asked, okay, please send us uh, uh, your your templates so that we we are going to be compliant from the beginning. But it, we we need people to contradict us to to tell us this makes no sense. And this is happening increasingly. But uh, I think we we still have a uh, quite some way to go. But I I'm optimistic that in a year's time we will have uh, really made progress. Over. Thank you, Philippe. And Thank you for this first round of questions and the uh, the inputs uh, and sometimes answers that uh, that you have uh, offered that the four speakers have offered. Angarad and uh, Nishani, have you been doing some more uh, magic magical things in uh, in clustering the questions? Yes, absolutely. So we have had a, a good number of questions coming in regarding COVID nineteen. Uh, there are a couple of questions here that I can combine. It might be interesting to hear from Gloria on this. So first of all, a question from Florence. Is COVID-19 a humanitarian crisis? If so, how does principled humanitarian action apply? And then perhaps a follow-up question. This is coming from Habimana, who is based in DR Congo. How ready is Africa to face the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, then we also have a question coming from Heidi, who is connecting from Sudan. We'll just find that here. Yeah. So this is a question coming from Heidi, and it's addressed to Eve. Are we in a post-principles world? Have we entered into the age of hyper-partiality? communities looking after themselves locally or via the diaspora. And then we have a question from Adrio in Germany. Adrio is addressing this question to Yves or Philippe and, and uh, writing, most speakers seem to be pointing at states and non-state actors for breaching or undermining humanitarian principles and not acknowledging the diversity of NGOs and their approaches. How are the actions or operating frameworks of NGOs themselves also potentially undermining humanitarian principles? And then finally, we have a question coming in from Rachel, connecting from the UK. This is a question for Inger. Should humanitarian actor, actors be doing more to assess how they use humanitarian principles to make decisions in their responses? And if so, how? What do we expect humanitarians to do if they decide that they simply cannot work ethically and in a principled manner in a certain context, yet there are immediate humanitarian needs? Back to you, Ignacio. Thank you, Angarad. Gloria, would you want to take that first question from uh, from Florence? 
is COVID-19 a humanitarian crisis? How, how does principled humanitarian action apply in this situation? Gloria, have you been thinking about this? Not really, but I think I'm able to put in the small content I understand about it. Well, um, on the COVID-19, is it a humanitarian crisis? I'll say yes to some degree. But then um, how we are dealing with it in our context is also done. Luckily enough, it has not yet reached our country. That's, that's one. But... Um, from our operations and the human and the wider humanitarian operations in South Sudan, definitely it's taking an, a toll on it, um, a great effect on it. In that, you know, agencies are not prepared for it. Um, we are trying to, you know, see better ways of how we create awareness, not just within the agencies themselves, but also amongst the beneficiaries that, you know, we are currently serving. And it's so unfortunate that within the humanitarian sector, also in South Sudan, is that we're having having quite a lot of international staff and majority because of the closing the closures of borders and things like that um, is that many people are, you know, going back to their home countries and the locals are the ones now in the ground and we're trying as much as possible to understand what this is all about, create awareness um, in our own context. Um, maybe on the follow-up question on how ready is Africa to deal with the pandemic? Um, I would not say that we are extremely well prepared, but with the ongoing um, alerts and awareness created globally through assistance of agencies such as the WHO, I think they are they are putting preparatory measures in the different countries and. Um, it's just a thing country to country in a context like South Sudan, I think the WHO is taking a greater lead in that and slowly I think we're getting there. Thank you, um, Gloria. I'm sure if we open uh, for the, the COVID-19 questions, everybody would uh, would want to give a word. But I think, uh, Eve, you've signaled that you would like to to, to, to drop in a, a couple of comments on uh, on that question too. So over to you, Eve. Uh, fairly brief as you can as you often are thank you i think the question is is covid-19 a humanitarian crisis and the response is yes of course it's a public health crisis but it is and there's a very strong humanitarian component i think we all know uh, when we face pandemia that there are critical humanitarian issues and i think really one of them is of course access to health uh, which is so central, uh, how do we guarantee that, in fact, the most, the most vulnerable, the people off-grid almost, have access to health? This is absolutely central. We see that already in, in some of the country here in Europe, and I think we will see that more and more. We've seen that in China also, and we will see that in, 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 in country where the health system will not be in a position to provide basic services to the population. So I think, yes, it is already a humanitarian crisis, and it will be a, big, a bigger one, I would say, no doubt on that. And Eve, to follow up, um, uh, I think it was from Sudan, uh, the, the question from Su Sudan, are we in a post-principles world? I, I, I love this, this uh, element of post-principles. Post I would say no, uh, uh, we are in a world which is in fact polarized, uh, uh, and I would say where principles are more important than ever. Maybe your point, which I like in the questions, is to recognize that community, some community, have a possibility because they are able to connect themselves with their diaspora, for example, to in fact uh, find their own way to get aid. And that's great. And I think we should welcome that. Our added value is very clear. We as a collective should be able to provide, in fact, principal humanitarian actions. And I really insist on that one. And we should think about people which are off totally off-grid. Think about prisoner, detainee. Think about people who have no access uh, to Wi-Fi, uh, to take two examples, which are or migrant in a very difficult situation. These people are what I consider off-grid, the most vulnerable. They won't have community with them, and we need to be able to help them, really. So I think, yes, uh, there is an element of polarization. There is an element of moving to maybe a point 
most principal world, but the principle at such and a principle approach is more important than ever. And I, it helped me just also to answer quickly on the on the diversity of approach from NGOs and maybe just to share something. I am of the of the opinion that we need to create common grammar. And in that sense, we didn't speak about certification, but I do believe that certification is a nice way, is an important way to do that. And I think maybe you know HKAI, um, which is uh, an, uh, uh, an organization who helps to certify and certifies NGOs around the world. Uh, and I think a certified that, uh, uh, you know, against the, the common humanitarian standards, against principle. And that's so interesting because, yes, you can have a different approach, but we should all agree as a collective that we have one approach when it comes, uh, comes to principle. Over. Thank you, Eve. And with the, the, the few minutes we have, uh, we have left before, unfortunately, having to, uh, to close, um, uh, Philippe, as, as, a, as a donor, would you also want to comment on that question of the, the diver diversity of, uh, of NGOs and also how NGOs themselves also potentially undermine humanitarian principles? This was a question coming from uh, Adrio based in Berlin. Yes, uh, I think it's a very important and relevant one and, uh, and Eve has already provided uh, an answer. I think we, we should not be naive. The, uh, all of us, uh, I'm sure, have had situations in which uh, a minister or whoever told us, oh, I have also my NGO, can I send you an application? And so, yeah, it's not because you call yourself an NGO or you claim that you are part of civil society that um, uh, you, you imply automatically that you are principled and ethical and so on and so forth. So, so yes, I, I, I think uh, one way, and I would agree with Eve, this is ideally the way with the core grant and standard, with self-evaluation, with the, the demonstration, the declaration of uh, duty of care and due diligence. Uh, with third party verification and certification and with peer pressure, uh, I think we, we can go uh, a long way. And there again, uh, I think the, the NGO community and there I address the ones who are principled, uh, you have to tell us donors that you, you need there again to, to have a, a, a set of, uh, com compliance rules and regulations and criteria that are consistent. It's part of the issue and it increases the transaction cost. It blurs the lines and it gives us all less value for the resources we can engage for the most vulnerable ones. Uh, that's an important part of the equation. The, so uh, typically we need to localize we need to work in a more equitable, multi-stakeholder mindset. We need to live the notion of genuine partnership. We recall that the 33rd conference had one big topic, which was trust. So we, we need more trust, but to build trust, uh, there is a need for compliance and, and really a, a profound uh, ethical and, and value-based uh, humanitarian community. And we are all co-responsible for, for this. Over. Thank you, Philippe. And I, I would like to turn then to, to Inger. Inger, you, you, you'll be the, giving the last, uh, the last comments as, uh, from, the, from the, the, the speakers. And um, uh, see if you can, you can cover a little bit and you can, you can add also some closing words if you, if you want. Uh, the question from Ray, Rachel, which is really the question of um, ethics. Uh, what happens if, uh, if we decide that we simply cannot work uh, in a principled manner in certain contexts? Yeah, and I think that, I mean, listening to all of us, I think that we, we many of us uh, find ourselves very close to that in, in some of the areas or countries where we work uh, and, and even having faced that uh, situation a couple of times. I think, and that goes back to, to the first part, should we assess how, how we use the principles uh, to make decisions? 
I think we all do. I hope we all do, because that's why we have the, the principles. Uh, I do think what uh, to is point that it is key that we have a common understanding, common grammar, you said, one approach, so that we are consistently standing up for the principles. Because in the more and more polarized world, if we don't stand strong, if we don't stand unified, who else will? So I would say that now it's more important than ever to, to stand for, for the principles and, and make the ethical decisions. If we do find ourselves in a situation where we feel that we cannot engage uh, because uh, because it's, it's against the principles, we cannot ethically stand for it. I, I do think we, we need to do what has been said by me and others during the this, this conversation, we need to then act as, as uh, partners. We have to join up, be propositional, and, and not accept the status quo. But we might have to uh, withdraw from some of the humanitarian responses at certain times because it's, it's impossible for us to work there. But I do think that that is also, depending on what organization you are, we do have different, uh, we all stand behind the principles, but we also have different risk appetites and, and uh, we are more or less risk averse. I do think that is, is quite, it's a complicated but very important question and we need to join up more and, and discuss if we find ourselves in a, in a very ethically difficult situation, what do we then do as a coalition? How do we make sure that we speak out and, and uh, that we are not accepting the status quo? Uh, so, yeah, we need to stand stronger than ever and stand united. Thank you. I think it's great to finish the, this conversation with uh, standing, standing stronger and united need, needed more than, uh, than ever. Inger, Gloria, uh, Philippe and Eve, uh, thank you very much. There were no eye contacts, no kicking under the table or no sign language, but I think we had a, a good, a good flow. And I really want to thank you. I want to thank also all the participants who have uh, brought in uh, uh, questions. Uh, unless I read badly, I find it really amazing that after 90 minutes, there's still as many people as after uh, fif uh, the first 15 minutes. So if everybody's okay, we can keep going. No, I'm not sure about that. I, I hand over to Angarat. <laughs> Okay, very good. Yes, we keep going, but uh, after a pause of two and a half hours, I hope that you will all rejoin um, for the next session, session two, commencing in two and a half hours. In the meantime, we will be leaving this event room open until the next session, so you can, if you wish, continue to discuss in the chat. You're very welcome to do so. Uh, in case, after some time, if you find that you're kicked out of the event room, you can simply sign back in with the login link for the next session, and uh, that will be posted in the chat, and I believe it's also coming out to you in a reminder email uh, in about an hour and a half. Okay, so hope to see all of you again online soon. Uh, in the meantime, this is Herod Lang and the whole team from ICFA and PHAP here signing out from Geneva. Bye-bye.